questions for you, just if you have them, because uh, I'm sure after the talk, people might be excited to, to drink, or they might be excited to, to ask features on uh, what I talked about, which is just to get some functionality in one step, like so. Any, Do you think my is That's not in my school. I think what's interesting is, is how uh, others outside the database industry evaluate and talk about performance versus how we evaluate and talk about performance. It is interesting. So one of the things, for example, that uh, tends to be first, to me first. That, that we value a lot is performance consistency, where everything gets more or less the same response time. You know, if you think about uh, database queries similar to like going to a restaurant, I can have a good experience and you have a bad experience. Or if you're making a car, I can have a really fast one and you have a slow one. We've got the same model. Or we have a really safe one and you have accidents because we have defects. So it is interesting how how, uh, how performance is evaluated and how criteria is set. I'll kind of answer that question that way. I have, a, I have a general question about sure. MySQL. So if you Google for MySQL stuff, you normally get the forums and then really outdated and funky. Are you still doing support that way, or is it more like on Stack Overflow now? Where's a good place to look for MySQL knowledge? Uh, it's up to you. I think to be successful, we have to engage in many communities. <laughs> and communities sometimes form around languages or frameworks, and people have to be comfortable with that. Uh, and the question is where I hang out in particular. Uh, yeah, I like Stack Overflow. I know there's a lot of technical people that, that answer questions on there too, but on the MySQL forums as well, sometimes if your question is very specifically related to a specific team, uh, they hang out on that forum subcategory. Okay, yeah. that's good to know. Other questions? I, I was just saying, uh, you know, sort of Postgres has done a bit of Jacob on the kind of JSON and stuff as well. Where do you see yourself in comparison to that? Right. So um, I'll answer that that Postgres has, as has SQL Server, as has Oracle, as has DB2, um, SQLite, and probably tons of others that have missed. It's actually a draft standard to the SQL uh, language. So um, we're all moving in this direction. I think it's good. I think it's an opportunity to, to have schemaless data alongside. Um, where we focus in you know, most of our optimizations is uh, OLTP workloads. It's an acronym that just means transaction processing. And I think we're really strong in, in, in that. Um, Postgres, perhaps, they have very good SQL language support in the, in the full set. Uh, enviable even compared to commercial databases. Um, where we're choosing to add more optimizations is generally in the transaction processing still, where we want to have just the best high throughput, highest vis visibility in terms of uh, features, diagnostics. Uh, and then we're choosing specific opportunities where we can you know, basically pick fights with established players. So 5.7, we chose JSON, and we chose geospatial. But yeah, it's not really a point, it's not really a question, but it brings back a bad to me of Oracle throwing XML into binary large objects and trying to query them with all bits of SQL. And it's right. just such a performance subject. So I, that's, that's, I, you know, yeah. I, I'm, I'm really going to find out why this is different. We'll, yeah, we'll have some discussion on that, the, the, the good and the bad of this. Uh, what I like compared to XML, and it is similar, you, you are correct, is that JSON as a, as a dialect, it doesn't support comments. And uh, if you modify the structure of JSON with white space and stuff, I don't think it affects people as much as if you do that with XML. So for us to do transformations and how we store JSON, before we present it back to you, is a far less lossy way. I think it's a lot more natural. Yeah. Um, it is kind of interesting because every database did get pressure to add XML features about 10 or 15 years ago, and then the world just switched to JSON. Yeah. And then it is, it is similar in that. But I, I think it's a little bit better. OK. Yeah. In my eyes, again. Why are you adding different versions? You recommend Yeah. So, so we have a concept called a, a storage engine. Our default is in ODB, and that is what I would recommend as well. 
a lot of our optimizations uh, target InnoDB. Uh, there's a myth that says that MyISM is faster. In a lot of cases, InnoDB is faster. Um, I think some of the value, specifically with InnoDB, that's also maybe misdescribed, is that it supports transactions. And, and transactions, when well implemented, um, they allow you to uh, write an application that doesn't have to account for as many boundary cases, which is where you end up writing a lot of your code if you're managing a large system. And, and there's a lot of value by, by having some reliability in your system by having that. So in, in ODB is absolutely my default. How, how come the choices are there for an upgrade path? So my ISM was our previous default. In ODB is our new default. Um, there's still some performance characteristics that people might rely on for my eyes at. It has a slightly smaller disk footprint. It's better at table scans and index scans. Uh, it takes time to be able to convert it to an ODB. So we, we uh, provide good support, we provide a good upgrade path. But, but if you were starting today, you know, ODB is the better choice. We haven't come out and said that it's deprecated, but uh, I would question every use case that's my eyes in specific. Yeah. Yeah, that, that deprecate word may come in the future. It's it's possible. Yeah, our our, uh, um, our five seven release answered some of the last questions that were really my eyes in specific, uh, which was our, our GIS indexes. We had them for my eyes and we didn't have them for an ODB. We've added them now, so there's really very few cases that, that my eyes in would be the better choice. Yeah. Yeah. So we changed the default in ODB in MySQL 5.5, which was about 2010 timeframe. But if you actually did import your data from an older version, it'll explicitly say that the engine is X in the MySQL dump format. So then you could have that engine based on that as well from upgrading. Other questions? Uh, for those that just arrived, uh, we will start at some point, but um, uh, while we have the opportunity, I'm just answering general MySQL questions. <coughs> Feature requests or whatever you may have. Uh, I, I work as product manager for the MySQL server. Um, I work from home, I'm based out of Toronto, and I'm on a European tour launching MySQL 5.7. This, I think, is my 20th day. Wow. Yeah, towards the end of the tour. So, so it's basically perfect to this point. I try new <laughs> things every time. <laughs> Any general questions? How do we pick new features? Why do we add that? Why, when will we add this? Happy to have an answer. Is it like actual? Is it like general availability? Yes, it is. Yeah. So my sequence, you can get it. Yeah, we have our own repos for, for app systems and YUM systems. But yeah, MySQL 5.7 went GA in October. Oh. Um, because of the way that we develop software, uh, and I'll get into that a little bit in my intro, I do think it was quite stable as it was released, and it was a good choice for new applications. I think there's always some time when it new releases made, though, for upgrades, where upgrades are just a little bit harder than, than new uh, installations, because we might have some incompatibilities from changing features that we're not actually aware of yet. So there's kind of like the first six months or so as we're uh, getting bug reports saying, this is incompatible, make sure you document it. And we're getting to the end of that, so I do think it's a, it's a good choice. Because it didn't go GA 570. That, that, that's correct, yeah. So I, I will describe that, how we develop software in my presentation. But we have uh, many opportunities for you to be able to test 5.7. Uh, and, and some of our users are using those opportunities in production and giving us good feedback. And obviously, MySQL is as ubiquitous as PHP is. OK. Um, uh, and it's out there, and it's on every box, and that's kind of kind of thing. But, um, how do you get on with um, the other people who play in that world, I'm thinking people like Amazon with their RDS and stuff like that, right. who obviously like at least five, six months behind yep. the GAs that you go with. Um, and 
uh, people who are also out there, uh, the alternate flavors, should mm -hmm. we say, people like the Kona, mm -hmm. who are obviously you know, the, the high performance side of things and stuff like that. And, uh, yeah, so I answer the Amazon, then the Kona, then Maria. Um, Amazon, we don't have any commercial relationship with. So they will uh, take out software, and then they'll make small changes, and then they'll call it RDS. They also have another offering called Aurora. Yeah. Um, I'm not too familiar with it yet. Um, I do, for like competitive knowledge, try and understand how every database works. Um, it looks like it's based on an early release of 5.6, and it's got lots of customization. I think the challenge for, for them will be how they rebase and grab out a new stuff. Um, with, Aurora is basically it does look like they've changed something in the storage layer. Yeah. Yeah. It's um, being a VB, it's got a lot of storage, and it's basically out to uh, cloud type of scale for storage, yeah. which is the classical ones and the private ones. Yeah, that, that's, that's what I observe. I mean, you can't tell because it's a service entirely how it works. Um, with Picona, um, on, on a personal level, I have a great relationship with them. I, I worked for them a, a few years ago and then rejoined the MySQL team. Um, I, I like interacting with them, we meet each other at, at conferences. Um, we challenge each other in a way that grows the MySQL ecosystem. Um, our own customers, they have a lot of confidence in knowing that they have a choice of supplier, and it just grows and everything expands. And our customers kind of select us um, based on their needs, um, us being the larger of organization. Um, we cover the full spectrum of the server, and if they have Emergencies and people care about their data, it's their greatest assets. I think we're in a good position to be able to support them. Um, the Maria relationship's a bit tougher because it kind of attacks us in, in the media. And that's just hard to engage with. Yeah. 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 And our Oracle doesn't engage with stuff in the in the media. Uh, it's just yeah, you, you can't touch it without getting, you know, dirt on your hands. Other questions? I think for me, what I know of this release now, it's probably one of the milestone releases against the other popular open source PostgreSQL. So I've had a few of these kind of features, especially on GIS. Kind of no SQL style features for right. quite some time now. How do you think, given your scale and size, you're going to be able to get traction in sure. that space against that perhaps sure. slightly more established player from a historical perspective? Yeah, I mean, you, you could perceive it as that way because there is kind of interesting as two features they had. But I, I do think that it's a natural overlap as well with what our customers are asking for. If you look, look at GIS in particular, um, Every new app has some sort of mobile component. Mobile stuff is all about location. It's, it's natural, and we either we had to add that to, to, to shift for this paradigm. Um, for, the, uh, for the JSON stuff, as I mentioned uh, earlier, this is something that's happening to all databases. There's a draft standard specification. Uh, PostgreSQL has a pretty good implementation of that draft. I think we do too. Yeah, there's, there's just demand all around for that. I, I don't think it was specifically targeted for, for Postgres. No, I do yeah. You know, you have these conversations with your peers who kind of go, oh yeah, Postgres QL, and it's like we always used to bring those features out. Right. And this is the moment of my SQL. Right. From my perspective, we just got to show them. You know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Sure. In terms of um, take ups, I'd like to suggest no, I can't take some sort of time. So I kind of want to use it everywhere. Right. Is it about any, uh, like, do you know anything about it? You know, is it in the top of the top of the top? Yeah, I, I think the question is what's the uptake of 5.7? I mean, I, I can see the download stats. Uh, we haven't made any public comment on it yet, so I don't know if I. Should either. Um, I'm happy with the. Uh, <laughs> I'm happy with how it's going. Yeah. I, I'm happy with how it's going. Yeah, I I think we hit a good feature set. I'm very proud. And in the next session, we're going to see it turns out between people. Then between seven and fifteen people, and that is five seven. 
Uh, we would hope so. Okay. Yeah, I don't know if a decision's been reached on that yet. But uh, on the maintainers team for, for MySQL and Ubuntu, um, we have people that we employ that are uh, directly assisting. The freeze is there, sir. Okay. <laughs> the, the, the page we sent into Panama, so. That's a bit of a It's not totally exciting. And watching the good system engineers, but it's no guarantees either. Obviously, you know, coming from the database perspective, we're probably most of those other engineers on the coding side at some level. So we, we regularly use this tool as part of the day job. We never get far from it. Sure. Uh, you know, but most of the packing on PHP type code at some point or another. Um, you know, for me, the, the step change that's happened in the PHP world with the advent of PHP 7, it's literally, you can see the graphs drop in terms of performance overhead on the machine. So I'm equally finding that with 57 but it's the internal engine optimization that happened on this branch are, again, you know, literally, you can see the cycles drop on the performance graphs on, on the service and stuff. Yeah. To me, that combination just accelerates that. Powerful set that's historically powerful, ready for the next three to five years. Right. So, to me, really happy that so this is both kind of randomly comes to this point in time. Where performance is a feature. Into a brand new world. Really, it's probably, I mean, literally, you can run twice as much, four times as much on some servers setups than you could six months ago. Right. And I think that's just against some of the other things that we have these conversations around. Other technology stacks and so on. I still think it's a new, it's almost like a new powerful company. Right, yeah, we, we released a benchmark with MySQL 5.7 showing that we can do 1.6 million queries per second, which is no reasonable number. Yeah. 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 Were there any um, features that you had to pull from 5.7 that disappointed you that they didn't make it? Um, there was a change in prioritization with some stuff. I, I think JSON was a late addition, but our development model allows us to do that, uh, where not everything is locked in, in advance. I think all the choices that we made uh, were the right choices, but the choices always have to be made. Yeah. But presumably, you don't want to be any more specific, because that's kind of no, well, yeah, the slide point. There's always pressure with time. We've, we've got some labs releases out. Uh, for example, um, one on our new data dictionary. If you're a long time MySQL user, uh, you'll be familiar with these FRM files. And we're planning to rip them out and replace it with InnoDB internally. Um, I would have loved to see that hit 5.7. It would have uh, risked the, re the release. And uh, it was something that's still available as a labs release that will be featured in the future. I, it, it simplifies a lot of stuff for us. Okay. Well, sure. We did some uh, announcements first. Cause All right, absolutely. I'm going to see. Uh, captive audience. So. <laughs> <laughs> no, we have you. Yeah. Um, so, welcome along. Uh, this is a joint effort between the Drupal uh, user group in the Northwest and HP Northwest. Um, so, I'm not going to explain you really, but there <laughs> we go. Uh, so, um, yeah, so PHP events coming up. Oh. So, um, just some announcements first of all. Uh, there's PHP UK, which is starting on Thursday. Is anyone going to that? <laughs> We're speaking, so it's yeah. Like yeah. 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 yeah, You've got no choice then. So, that's happening in London. Um, so, that's one of the biggest PHP conferences in Europe. Yeah, London is. So, um, and as well as that, we've got next month's speaker as well. So we meet the first Tuesday of every month, if you're not aware. Um, and normal service does resume next month. And we actually have a uh, talk by someone you're probably familiar with if you are from the Drupal group, Eli. Can you want to give us a quick overview on what you're going to be talking about? Uh, so next month, I'm going to be giving a review of the newest version of Drupal that came out in November, uh, Drupal 8. But from a PhD developer's point of view, so we can show you what's new and why if you have looked before and dismiss it, it might just be worth another look. Charlie took it. So it's Drupal Calendar coming up. Uh, we have 
Drupal Camp London, uh, which is on the first week of March, so six, seven, because six and seven of March, um, which is probably the biggest Drupal Camp in, say, so UK, definitely, but uh, maybe Europe. Numbers. Um, a few people from Northwest Talk as well, uh, myself included. Uh, so that's, that's always a good event to go to. Uh, and next month, obviously, we get the second Tuesday of the month uh, is our Drupal User Group meetup where we're having a talk by. I don't know, you can't remember either, can you? <laughs> it's on uh, mental health, basically. So we're, we're looking at uh, mental health talks. Subject like those so arts and, and group of so. and, and CMR. And CMR. Uh, and yeah, the uh, Drupal 8 configuration like so, uh, as well. Right. Are there any uh, announcements from the room? Any events coming up? At this point, we normally get Drupal. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. Drupal events. Yeah, the Drupal events. Yeah, the Drupal events. Yeah, so we've done that. Other than you know, it's all Drupal, so bad Any other events that people are aware of that would be of interest? Any conference presenters or anything? There's Amsterdam Conf on Thursday, and I'm wondering what they're going to do to But that's still about Amsterdam to you. Is that near to Arena? So I shoot you. Why not? Yes. Yeah, the other things like the Judge Peer Conference. Yeah, DPC is still open. Also, some of the wider web ones, I think Scotland JS, I don't know, they're not, they closed last week. Yeah. Um, <laughs> that's good. Uh, just perhaps another thing to mention, I don't know if people are aware, <laughs> in Manchester we now have over 50 um, use group type events like these sort of things, and there's actually a meta group about that called Tech uh, Events Northwest, um, at technw.uk. Yes, it is. And that's got basically a big Google Calendar feed of all the events that are happening around Manchester. And you it's now reached the stage where there's like some nights, three or four events happening. So you know you definitely need to be learning Manchester if you've got it. Um, you, you, you can always something you can go to. Um, and basically that group is getting the event organizers to meet up in real life and stuff and actually look at how we uh, stop reinventing the wheel each time and share other things about venues, sponsors, get the codes of conduct and just trying to you know improve Manchester because it's a real vibrant book and this is not happening in London for example. So by being involved in that uh, it's something that there's an active Slack community and stuff like that's 80 of people in there. These are all group organizers. They're not just the, the kind of attendees, but it's useful to pester your events organisers to get involved with that, if not, because it's actually now trying to reach the next round of power at that kind of level of voice, because we've reckoned that between us we represent something like 3,000 attendees, and that suddenly starts to have voice in terms of things like being able to get group discounts and all those sort of things. And so it's, you know, this is a kind of grassroots natural organisation thing that's come about in the last six, seven months. Uh, and, you know, uh, I'm kind of representing the HP Northwest Stuff and you guys are in the yeah, yeah. You're not, not into <laughs> not in real life, yeah. Yeah. But I just think it's a really exciting time that that's happening, that that's actually coming together. So, I think the other thing is there's lots of cross group speaking opportunities that are starting to be demanded because some of the groups haven't got many speakers, some have got a plethora. And I think there's a lot of Kind of backfill learning, talking about getting the group organisers together to have like a workshop day about how to run these events better and stuff like that. So people are building on each other's expertise. I just think it's a really exciting time for Manchester. So I just want to put that out there. Uh, if you're involved in, in organising a group and you're not a member, uh, give us a shout out later and I'll uh, get you included. Thank you very much. Any other announcements? Is anyone recruiting? Yeah, always. <laughs> 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 <laughs>
Uh, yeah, uh, always looking for um, good midway to senior talent. Um, and uh, we've had some new hires recently at the kind of lower end, so we're kind of <coughs> looking to sprout yet yeah, another internal team and stuff. So, Micro Digital, uh, we build uh, bespoke business critical systems for people, usually using PHP and various flavors, and that they're my skill. Amongst other things. But uh, yeah, a uh, good growing team, technical project managers, do it right. First time, all that kind of attitude stuff. Uh, and we kind of live, breathe, eat the agile thing, but not at the exclusion of interfacing with enterprise. So, yeah, if you want to know how we actually do that, make it work. Can you just say that? Makes sense. Common sense. No, no. Enterprise. Enterprise. Yeah. Documentation. Uh, so, yeah, give me a shout out. Okay. Access. Access. Access my company looking for project managers. So if you're here, a project manager with some, some you know, developer know how then get in touch. Always with this. Um okay, so, right. so um we've got a very special speaker this month, who is all come all the way from Canada and is currently doing a European tour. Um he's the MySQL product manager and Morgan Tucker. So I just joined the product management team actually. I was previously community manager as I think it said in my bio. Um, so two months on the job and I've spent almost a month of the traveling. It's, it's been fun. I want to talk tonight about one specific feature in, in MySQL 5.7. It's, it's a new opportunity to be able to store a strategy and unstructured data together for new database, uh, something that you've not been able to do before. Um, this is just one feature that we have in MySQL 5.7, but I think it's a good story. And so that's what I'm mainly going to be talking about. Uh, before I get to that, to, to talk about what makes this new JSON experience, I just want to give you about a five minute overview to talk about us, to talk about how we develop software, how we release software, some of the other stuff that's in MySQL 5.7 and why this is just exciting opportunities ahead. So um, MySQL uh, 5.7, uh, it took about two to three years to develop. Uh, we joined the team at Oracle uh, in January 2010. We've released three releases in this time, uh, MySQL 5.5, MySQL 5.6, and just in October, MySQL 5.7. Um, releases in, in database terms and operating system terms are a big deal. Uh, people care about stability. You know, there's a lot of things that have to change and we're on possibly a less frequent cycle than, than some other applications that release. I think what's nice uh, about us at Oracle is that we've, we've really grown. Uh, the engineering count that worked on MySQL 5.7 is the largest team that's ever worked on MySQL. It's, it's 2x the size. Uh, the, uh, it's 3x in terms, of, in terms of the QA team. And on core infrastructure, this is one of the things that you really care about. Um, we've uh, identified this, and, and I'll talk a bit about our release cycle as well, and, and how we release and let you test MySQL. And we make sure that everything that we put out is approximately release candidate quality. Um, the, the third item that, that's really uh, important to point out is when we put out a GA release, uh, we're very careful uh, which new functionality or changes that we make. And, and our support team assists us with this, so whether you're or not you're a customer, the benefit that they review and, and choose which functionality should be backported to GA releases. So, uh, as I said, 5.7 GA, uh, October uh, 2015, exciting times. Uh, you may have heard about MySQL 5.7 for some time longer than that. You may have heard about DMR, or developing milestone releases that we put out. Uh, what we do is when we develop a new feature, uh, or a set of new features, up to three times a year, we'll put out a preview release. And to hit this preview, uh, we make sure that we've done a high level review. The new functionality works with existing functionality. A low level review in terms of uh, you know, at least two code reviews. We make sure that the functionality, the architecture, we can support it. And we aim for 80% plus code coverage. And then we call it a DMR. And we say that it's approximately a release candidate quality. Uh, as I've been touring around in the last uh, couple of weeks, uh, I co-presented with one of our largest users uh, in Europe, Booking.com, 
and, and they were talking about how they started using the DRRs two years ago and uh, what sort of uh, opportunities they've had to give us feedback into how we can improve our software. Uh, this is the best opportunity because once it hits GA, uh, sometimes if we make a change, even though it's a good change, uh, that change could break backwards compatibility. So it makes it a little bit harder to incorporate any suggestions then. So uh, this, is, this is your opportunity to be able to get early stuff, but not that early that it's, that's not stable. And then we move into GA, and then we say that it's available for general use. I think also based on this release cycle, uh, when we do say that something's ready, it's actually pretty close to ready. There's a good opportunity. If you're developing new apps now, they should be using YSCO 5.7. There's one other sort of release that we put out, and we call these labs releases. Basically, we're developing a new feature uh, to highlight a couple of labs that we have out at the moment. We have something called group replication, which is like a replication system where you can write to any, read to any systems in sort of like a, a loose cluster. I think this is exciting opportunities, but we want more feedback on that. It hasn't passed all of the qualification of TRMRs yet. Another labs release uh, that, that we've got out there uh, that we were having a chat about earlier, uh, something that I think uh, is going to be really important to the future of MySQL is, is changing some of the plumbing. If you're a long-term time MySQL user, you're familiar with these FRM files. Uh, we're working on changing that so that we use you know, UB internally to, to store state. We call this a data dictionary project. Uh, it's a big project, changes a lot of things. Uh, we have a release out there in a form that allows you to give this feedback. Uh, this will simplify things like replication, crash state, it'll make information schemas, queries fast. It'll allow us to more easily add new features because we have a generic repository to which to store metadata. Um, so you are here, this is, this is GA. Uh, when we launched, we said, yes, MySQL 5.7 is out there. Uh, this was the list of features that we put in the press release. And we said under two main categories, we've got better performance and we've got better manageability. As I said tonight, we're really talking about the native JSON support in particular. Some other things that I can highlight for you in this slide that, that, that make me really proud. Uh, performance, three times faster than MySQL 5.6. And we scale to, to you know, some of today's modern hardware. Replication improvements, where slaves can have multiple masters, masters that they still started from, and slaves can apply changes in parallel much more efficiently than they could in previous versions. We've improved the optimizer cost model. Uh, internally, when you issue an SQL query, uh, it's very similar to how GPS works. You basically say the destination, and the database internally has to figure out how to execute that. And when you think about the evolution of, of GPS systems, there's kind of two ways you can improve it. You know, one, you could discover more routes and, and more ways to be able to take a path. And the other is you could do something like add traffic data, and you can make the decisions far more accurate. And we've basically added traffic data to MySQL 5.7, so queries execute far more consistently than they have in the past. On the manageability side, uh, there's, there's the JSON support, uh, there's better security, secure by default, and, and there's two features that are related here called performance schema and sys. So uh, I, I previously did consulting. One of my observations from doing performance consulting is that people have performance problems don't have it because the database server is slow. They have it because they lack the visibility to be able to understand what's happening that shouldn't be happening. And we make this very easy. So on a new, fresh MySQL 5.7 installation, you can run a query like select star from sys.statement analysis, and you can find your top 10 slow queries. And you can get to work straight away and being able to, to make them faster. Um, previously, you could say something like show process list, and you would get some granularity of data. Now you can do something like select star from sys.session, and you can get far more granular data as to how things are executing internally. I think that this is very important. So that was the press release version of, of what's new, and, and certainly more features than what we're talking about tonight. I have another view of, of this. Uh, where I have the complete list of features.com. <laughs> this is a domain I, I registered because I just wanted to demonstrate exactly how many there are. Uh, you know, as I said, two to three years in development. 
lots of minor things if you're a long-term user, these can be really beneficial. And I added up, there's just under 200 that I could find. So uh, this works on mobile as well. If we get to the end and you have questions and, and we have time, uh, I can probably describe uh, most of these in this list, but it's a long list, so I apologize. If there's some corner case that I have a little bit of trouble with. Um, so the last thing that I want to mention about us is, is uh, we're building a business around MySQL. We publicly said that it's very successful and it's growing. Uh, we have a commercial offering called MySQL Enterprise. Uh, if your business depends on, on MySQL, please consider this. Um, Enterprise has some features that are built on top of and around the MySQL server. Uh, MySQL has a plugin architecture that allows us to do this. So I'll highlight just a couple. Uh, we have a firewall, so you can whitelist and block blacklist queries you're executing. Uh, we have the ability to authenticate against LDAP, the ability to uh, audit certain queries and, and user activities. We have a monitoring tool, we have a backup tool, and we have commercial support available. Um, I worked on that support team 10 years ago. I'm very proud of them. They do good work. Um, but that's the main event. Um, let's, let's talk about JSON. Let's say, uh, what is this uh, new experience that we have available to store unstructured data that we couldn't do prior? And maybe preface it to say, for those that don't know JSON, it comes from JavaScript. And it's this notation to be able to store data. Uh, it's commonly used in APIs. Uh, it, it's pretty much replaced XML over the last 10 years. And now you can do JSON stuff on your server side. There's three things that work together here to make this experience. Um, we've added a JSON data type where we store JSON in a, in a more optimal way internally. We've added a set of about 20 functions, SQL functions, to be able to manipulate and search JSON on the server side. This is useful because it means you don't have to extract out all the data for some stuff and then insert it back in, you can do some stuff in the server side. No matter something called generated columns allows you to index this. So I'll describe these three in detail, and I'll start from the top, and I'll say, what's this new data type? And I'll use the simplest of examples. So uh, here I've created a table, I've put in employees, I've added a column, it's JSON. So previously you had integers, you had barcars, decimals, now you have JSON. You insert into this valid JSON, and you retrieve from this valid JSON. On disk, we store this how we want to, in a, in a more efficient way. But from your perspective, it just looks like JSON. So I'll go into the tech specs of that and say exactly what we do. Uh, we always store it in UTF-8, or my skill terms, UTF-8 MD4, as per the JSON's specification. It, it follows the, the right rules of JavaScript. Uh, we are optimizing this data type to make it very efficient for reads. This is one of our design goals of it. I'll talk a bit more about that in a second. We pass and we validate your JSON only when you insert or when you update. We never have to do this while you're reading. And this is why it's quite efficient to be able to read. And we have fast access to in each of the individual elements inside of your, your JSON blob of data because we have a dictionary per individual data type cell that has direct offsets, fixed access to be able to retrieve things efficiently. And I will show you performance numbers I have in my deck to see how efficient this is. Um, just one small addition or a set of additions to describe this in a bit more detail. Um, we support all of the data types that JSON supports, which is actually a fairly limited set. Uh, numbers, strings, booleans, objects, and arrays. Uh, we overload this in, in a way similar to the format BSON, if you're familiar with it, where we also support additional data types, like date, time, date, time, time step, need each, each of my skills data types. And I will have an example towards the back of my deck that shows you how you can work with the JSON world and the MySQL world together based on this overloading. So um, you may say, well, Morgan, currently I store JSON. I store it in MySQL and I use a text Varchar or a blob data type. Why do I need this JSON data type? Uh, there are two reasons why you need this JSON data type. Or two of text or, or Varchar. Um, reason one is that it is important to have some sort of validation. 
And you can only insert into this valid JSON. Uh, the other reason is that we have very efficient, very fast access to be able to retrieve parts of the document. There's a third reason that, that might come true in future, which is our format that we store this JSON in uh, does internally support an in-place update, where we could just basically have a large blob modify a small amount. Currently, we're, we're not doing this, at least uh, for MySQL 5.7. We have ideas where we can do this in future. So it's efficient, and I will show performance numbers with some sample data in just a second. But that was feature one. Uh, feature two is we have a set of JSON functions, this ability to, to manipulate server-side. And I will, uh, again, start with the very simplest of examples. I will create a variable in my MySQL command line client document. I will create, in that variable, just the simplest of, of JSON structures. This is an array. And then I'm going to use this, this new fancy JSON extract function and extract out of document using this JSON path. So we retrieve the first element here and, and return that back. So the JSON path, this is the only fancy thing that's really happening here. Uh, there's a set syntax for how to do this. Uh, the syntax, if you come from the JavaScript world, it's not too dissimilar from jQuery, where you might use a CSS selector. This is our equivalent to be able to extract out. Um, similar to, to jQuery as well, which makes it a little bit easier, is that you don't have to use this long form of JSON extract. If you're retrieving from a, a table, you can say the column name, and then dash greater than, and then say the path in quotation marks. So my examples will mainly use this shorthand JSON extract operator to extract part of documents out of JSON. And I have sample data. This will, will tie together the, the uh, experience just a little bit cleaner. So the, the city of San Francisco, they have a project called Open Data. This is your opportunity as a citizen uh, to be able to run your municipal government, essentially. And a lot of other cities have this. So um, I looked for uh, a sample data set that was about 200,000 JSON documents. I thought that this would be a good number to show you some initial performance numbers. Well, it's not as large as you know, databases will often be in production, but it'll run in memory and allow you to use the same examples that I use as well and import them in no time at all. So I imported uh, 200,000 documents that were representing subdivision parcels, basically just like blocks of land in the city. And they all have things like blocks of lands have. They have latitude and longitude. They have a street name, a street number, maybe a roll number or something. Uh, I imported this into MySQL, though, without having a schema. I imported it with just a primary key, and I called it picture, and I called it JSON. So very you know, unstructured, schemaless way, import it all basically into one column, because my, my ID column is just a primary key. You can repeat the same web and link to be able to download the same data. So uh, I do have an example showing what each of they look like. I uh, love what each of these uh, parcels look like. Um, it's not too important to point out anything here. Uh, what I do want to clarify, though, is say that these all 200,000 of these, they follow the same structure exactly. Uh, this is not a requirement. This is unstructured data. Uh, I'll pause for a second. Because I'll be on settling if people have to sit for it. Um, so, uh, it's unstructured, you know, potentially in your data set, you know, some records might not have coordinates to be able to describe uh, this particular parcel or handle. They might not have some of the properties. This is absolutely fine. We have a really natural way of, of handling this. Let's look at the common case first on this data set. Let's run a query and show how that shorthand operator um, really integrates to create a nice experience. Where I'm saying select start from features where feature dash greater than and then quotation marks uh, uh, adjacent path. I'm searching for properties dot street equals market. I'm trying to find a city lot in San Francisco on Market Street. It's one of the main streets running through San Francisco. There's, there's lots of records for Market Street, so I say limit one, and I grab a JSON, 
document that. So I want to highlight on this part that's in red to say that I think that's pretty good. It's very clean integration. Uh, let's say that I wanted to find a record where the feature properties.street doesn't exist because this is unstructured. Well, I can do that in a very relational way as well. Here I can say find where it is null. And in this case, everything follows the same structure, so I get an empty setback. But equally, if I did have something that wasn't mentioned, you would get rows back at that time. So I said the JSON data type is fast. That was one of my claims. Now that we have sample data, let's that's, that's, uh, run a query on it and let's see if that is true. So I have not added any indexes. It's a naive case. I will add indexes later. I'm going to show the raw performance first. Uh, sorry, um, does it consider any um, <laughs> like null value to be the same as the column not being present? Uh, does that make yeah, you could use like a, a another value or something like if you wanted to differentiate between them. So you could use like a JSON supports Boolean. You could do for like true or false or something if you wanted to. Or if it has a value, but it's like sent as an empty value. That was the question to differentiate. Yeah. Data. Yes. Uh, yeah, so let's say you've got type and call this. It's still really in the nice reality store that we store. Or it's nice file to try and say here it's not good eyes. Then get all of the keys. Right. Yeah, so I did star here, so it returns me that like they said. But much like I've used the function here in my red to be able to extract and identify a part, I can actually use the same thing here, replacing it with star, and I can find some subset of the data. Maybe I could also create a temporary table, and I could insert into that as well. If that is kind of your question, how to manipulate further than just grabbing a block, yes, it's possible. What if you have a shape of the text that you've got, can you get the key names as opposed to the values? Yeah, I, I think there is like a JSON keys or something like function as well. I have a full list of the the functions uh, about 10 slides forward. You couldn't exactly make sense to me before on both the feature name and the <coughs> Is that true? Is that always true or is it case sensitive or is it case sensitive? On, on the on you've got this properties and then you've got uppercase street, uppercase streets and name JSON, uppercase market, uppercase market is your result. Yeah. Uh, so you've got a full case sensitive match there. Does it have to be case sensitive? I actually don't know the answer to that one, but I can find out really quick later on as well. So then that's one thing you can set in some tables as well. Yeah. Yeah, if you're using MySQL data types, we support collations, which is the feature yeah. that describes comparisons. But uh, what the restrictions are on collations for this, uh, I'd have to check, because I said it's UTF-8 character set, but I didn't say what the collation is, and I, I'll, uh, I'll have to find that out. Other questions? I like questions midway through as well. It's the most exciting thing that, that, of, of my day. Okay. Um, so we have a naive performance example. What, what I've done is I've run a query deliberately to have to run through all 200,000 of them. That's the goal of this query. It's not a production query. It's a run a query that has to do some operation on 200,000 documents. So uh, on, on this side, I'm using the, the JSON data type. I'm saying select distinct and then one of these JSON path queries from features. The distinct part is the thing that makes it go through everything. And it could be an index if one was there, but as I said, I had not added one. So on 200,000 documents, it takes 1.25 seconds in memory. Uh, the the uh, path query also works on a text data type, something I didn't mention, but it will work on a text data type which creates a good upgrade path for you if you're currently storing JSON, which a lot of people uh, and we can see that the performance for this is 12.85 seconds, it's 10x worse. So it is very efficient at reads because it has direct key access to be able to find the, the value as it touches each one of these documents. Versus, versus on the right side it has to pass the JSON structure and then it has to figure out after it's passed it which part of that document it can retrieve. Um, but it gets better because we can add indexing. 
This is feature three. I said there's three features that work together to create this experience. The data type, the functions, and the generated columns. So start by showing a, a simple example of generated columns, not related to, to JSON stuff. Uh, I have a table. Uh, here's the definition of it. It's a visual representation. It's a little bit easier to follow. It's got a primary key for ID. Uh, it's got a column for by integer. And then it's got something called a virtual generated column defined as my integer plus one. Here's how I define virtual generated columns. I start it the same way as I started a regular data type, but I say as, and then this expression. As that other column, whatever it was, plus one. Virtual columns are read only. They don't exist in the real world, they're virtual. They just generated as you have to access this data. And you can use any expression here that you want as long as it's deterministic and it's a built-in MySQL function. So, as you can see where I'm probably getting at, you could use a JSON path query here. And then you could have a virtual column that's extracting out from some other JSON column. And the advantage of virtual columns is that virtual columns support indexes. So this is where the story ties together to be able to add indexes. So I'll go back to my sample data set. It was called features. I'm going to create a column called feature type that just matches the silly expression that I was doing in my career before trying to scan those 200,000 items. I have to choose a data type, so I'm going to choose bar car 30. I have to map between the, the JSON world and the MySQL world here. I do have to choose a data type. And then I use this expression feature type to be able to you know, extract that into the bar chart 30. This takes no time at all, because this is virtual. It doesn't exist in real life. And this takes whatever time to be able to do that. When I've got an index, then I can repeat the query, and it's faster. It's much faster. So we've gone down from 1.25 seconds to 0 0.06 seconds. Um, this difference is probably going to be larger in production. As you have more data, indexes, and logarithmic search, they just divide and conquer, divide and conquer, eliminate work. Uh, this is really where the real value is. So uh, I'll clarify that I, I'm actually extracting by feature type. Uh, here, I'm extracting, writing the query based on the virtual column. You don't have to do this. I'm going to actually use the original expression. And uh, I optimize and figure out there's a virtual column for that. And the virtual column has an index, so I can execute that query faster as well. Yeah. It, it never existed to start with. Yeah, it was just like kind of like a view. We had this expression that describes how it looks like but it quickly generates it on demand as you're executing queries. So your application can't tell the difference. We don't have to store any extra disk space, any memory requirements for virtual columns. They're just virtual. But it's still dumped as part of the table definition. It is dumped as part of the table definition. It says that it's virtual, as was my expression here. And your clients, they can't tell the difference. They see the real amount of data. So if you did, for example, do select star a lot, and you had a lot of virtual columns, you're going to send more data across the network. Uh, but other than that, they're more or less free. It's just some, some syntax. When you update the JSON or insert, presumably you have an update the index as well. That, that's right. So uh, as each row is modified, in this simple case, it doesn't matter because this is purely virtual. But in my next example, where I add an index, Indexes are material. Indexes are not virtual, so that does have to be updated. Yeah, the index exists in the, in the physical real world. Is there any difference in terms of you know, an index on any column with the JSON native uh, storage type with the language? Is it actually slower at writes then? Well, I'm, is it imperceptible to most use cases? I'm mapping it from the JSON type to the MySQL type. So the index itself is the same physical type. Your, your question uh, might be hypothetical, saying, 
Um, if we have to use an expression, the expression is expensive. Will it take more time to do update? Yeah, in theory, yes, it could be. But generally, I/O is, is so much slower than other activity that it's fairly well amortized. I think this will be would be the same. Yeah, if you were using not a, an underlying uh, JSON data type but a text data type, and you're doing a lot of manipulation in this expression, and I mean. I think you have to do a lot of work, but you could maybe find it measurable there. Yeah, but I think the cost is pretty small. It's uh, presumably you can only map it to SQL data types. If you've got something like a uh, hash in there at the end of that patch, then presumably it's good. Yeah, so I will get to that when we get to my last slide. So, <laughs> um, just saying where, where we're going and, and ideas we have. Uh, yeah, so this expression, it has to result in the value null, or it has to pass as this data type. If it doesn't, at least in our default SQL mode, you get an error. So this could be a way of emulating uh, check constraints or something if you want it to as well. It, it does have to pass. Two, on two slides, can you just explain what the formula yeah, yeah, this is not tied to JSON, it just makes the JSON experience. Oh, oh yeah, it's just I'm what I try to do is like a double JSON and say another column snap. So it's a way to configure somewhere where you've got like to each side as each dot type. So it's a way to configure what, what's in the type. So um that's what's in your schema. So I would flip, flip back I, and, and, and show you what one of these documents looks like. It's basically uh, this, because I've said that part of the document, that's what it's uh, indexing. But I could say some other path to pick something else. And it has to match the data type that I specify or return null. Either, either one of the options is valid. So if I were to, let's say, rename. Table of language, so make geometry different. Right. Would that mean just have need to generate So, what you could do there, if you're doing some rename or some fancy thing, is in your expression, you could have some sort of if null style deterministic way of saying, look for this first. If it doesn't exist, then use this one, and then you could you could use kind of the combination of two columns in a JSON schema for how you make a virtual column, it's possible. Um, no, I mean, it can do that reasonably efficiently. Uh, I mean, complexity is never recommended, I think. That's the general overarching, but there's nothing specific to this. Yeah. I, I, I have heard of people using uh, more complex built-in types than just using a JSON path. It's certainly good for that because this is really uh, in other databases, you know, called uh, index expression or something like that, or computative indexes. Um, it's the same feature. It's just called virtual columns. So there's other advanced stuff you can do with it to, to massage the data before you index. Uh, with the, um, the virtual columns, is it possible to then to be sort of uh, cross table, or is it all within the same table? Within the same table, yeah. Yeah, and the other maybe small limitation to point out there is it has to be a built-in function, not a UDF. But any of the built-ins have been deterministic for it. Okay. So um, they're virtual generated columns. Uh, there's actually two varieties of generated columns. I showed you the default example to start with, the virtual kind. They provide equivalent functionality with index on expression. The other variety can be achieved by saying this keyword stored. And these ones actually do exist. They maintain, they take disk space, they take memory. Whether or not you choose virtual or you choose stored generated columns, they both allow you to add indexes. There's just some very specific uh, limitations that stored columns allow you to get around. Very specific ones, unless you have these limitations, virtual is better. So you can't create a primary key based on a virtual column. You have to use a store. 
and you can't create a full text index or a GIS index on a virtual column that has to be on stored. Stored has the restriction that it requires space and it takes time to be able to add stored generated columns because they have to actually build. So virtual columns should be your default and your preferred usage. Okay, now that we've given that clarification, let's show more examples. Uh, I'll show more examples with uh, these functions on the server side that allow you to modify data. Here's one that you'll find yourself using quite a bit. We have the shorthand JSON operator to be able to extract out data, but if you extract out a string using a JSON path, it'll by default give it to you as a JSON value itself internally. And JSON values have these quotes on them. I, don't, I didn't point out explicitly on my slide, but the word feature when I ran this query had quotes on it. And you can just remove those quotes by saying JSON unquote. Very helpful function. Some other helpful functions as you're learning the JSON path syntax, you can run a query called JSON search. JSON search inside the column feature, match one or match many, for the word market, again looking for market street. And then it'll return back the path for which it found that value. And the path, of course, because it's a path, uh, can be plugged in and we can return back that equivalent value. This is the reciprocal query. Another thing to point out here is that uh, previously in my example, I had an aware clause and I used one of these JSON path queries. Now I'm demonstrating that you can also retrieve this in your select list. It works in both places fine. So some more advanced JSON manipulation on the server side, I can create valid JSON arrays, which I can then update JSON data with, combine with other stuff, and so forth. So I'm creating a JSON array here just in my uh, select field list, combining a column, it's called ID, a JSON path for the street, and a JSON path for the type, and it returns me back valid JSON arrays. Just like I can create a JSON array, a JSON array is basically this array function takes one or many arguments. It, it will go up to any amount and just create an array. I can also create a JSON object. JSON object accepts an even number of arguments, and it's basically like key value pairs. The, the odd values are the keys, the even values are the values. And then I can tie this knowledge together with a JSON object or a JSON array to show you an example of replace. We're here, I'm updating a feature as my JSON column at this specific path to whatever was there, replace it. I don't want it to say type equals whatever it was, which is feature. I want it to say type equals the JSON array feature above. Now you can see where you can do some manipulation server side. There are some opportunities. You can have a lot of data, so you don't have to pull in your application, but change it directly in MySQL. So the, the full set of functions that ship with MySQL 5.7, they're quite complete. I just showed you the ones on my slide here that are in bold. The other ones are, are the ones that are not in bold, and uh, when you grab my slides, here's a link to the manual that describes them in more detail. <coughs> Maybe one more that I would point out on this slide that I didn't have in my deck is uh, JSON valid. Because these functions will work on a JSON data type or other data, if you were using a text or a VACA and you wanted to see is that data valid, perhaps with the intention to convert it to a native JSON data type, you could do select star from that table where JSON valid column name you know, equals false, where it's not valid, and then I could find which records I have to fix before I convert it to the JSON data type, because they all must be valid. Is there a the JSON object, or is that covered by one? Presumably the replace is a all of the thing. Is there going to be an update, say, or updating this? Yeah, I'm not sure I understand the question now. Uh, I'll flip back a slide to make it easier. There's no updates or updates in place in those features. You said that was coming, presumably that no, <laughs> I, I misdescribed what I meant by update. I was describing an internal uh, mechanism. 
If you wanted to update, you would just do update my table set column equals new value. Yeah. Uh, what I was referring to uh, is that if new value is a function or just a partial set of a big document, what wouldn't it be nice if you didn't have to rewrite out that whole document internally? So you don't have to send it across a wider application, you don't have to run it through your really log system internally in MySQL. There's a performance optimization when you use a binary type and things are at fixed offsets that you can figure out just what the difference is and patch that. We don't have that bit yet. It's not a big thing. There will be no change to the language. It will just be Exactly. Exactly. I would say it's probably only important if you have very large JSON documents. The best size for a JSON document is probably not that much larger than what a row is already. Uh, this is just another way of manipulating. Maybe they're a little bit larger just because things are denormalized. What I think is useful though with JSON is that APIs speak JSON. And APIs can be verbose. And so this is why we see uh, opportunities by, by doing optimizations like that. Okay. I mentioned rows and row length and supply. We've got the kind of 65k limit in row. Does that then imply that because this is its own binary format, that it's actually page separately from the row? And does that then potentially lead to if you are trying to select things from the JSON uh, yeah. world and the rest of the row that it has to recomp? Is it in a temporary table, like the old text style, you know, the performance yeah. problem, and everybody's gone for the of our charts now instead of text fields? No, there's a few parts to that, that, okay. that problem, actually, the way you're describing it. So, um, internally, we use something very similar to Blob. Okay. Blob did overflowing, so it's not restricted to, like, 64K, and, like, they can be up to a gigabyte for the blobs. They can be up to a gigabyte for the, for the JSON documents. There is a limit, though, where each individual uh, page can only be half filled with an individual row, excluding the overflow of things, so excluding text and blobs. And that limit doesn't change. So that kind of describes where you're at. I, I, don't, I don't think these limits exist. Just as a little problem, therefore, deal with that in terms of memory optimization, mm -hmm. so that you can end up creating temporary and distance, mm -hmm. as opposed to temporary in memory and all that sort of stuff. So. Yeah, so as well on that, during the execution phase, we've improved a lot of those buffers to be variable length. So sort buffers, for example, in 5.7 are variable. Um, but we're going to advance, so I'm going to... That's all right. Yeah. But we just come up with the SAT. Yeah. Production yeah. Stuff. It's, it's important for us because it helps improve UTF-8 support to have variable length buffers. And it's much better in UT5.7. Okay, so three features uh, tying it together, the data type, the functions, and the indexing with generated columns. I, I'll say there's kind of a feature 3.5, uh, which is uh, our JSON comparator, which is that this integrates very well between MySQL types and the JSON types. And I alluded to this when I said that we overloaded to support additional types in, in JSON. So let me compare as, to, as a starting example, the JSON value of one, if I retrieve from a JSON document, I wouldn't have to do this task. But I'm doing it on one slide, so I have to task it. Compares to the MySQL type of one, that's true. A JSON document here, uh, which is just an object, number 1.1, compares to a JSON document and also matches. If I had two JSON documents, you know, left and right, and I compared them and they had the same data, but they had some of their keys in different order, these also compare as true. It's really tight integration between the JSON world and the MySQL type system. Right. Yeah, so you could do a JSON extract and you could try and pull out the subset using a path query and then you could compare it left and right and it will match. Because the JSON extract will return as a JSON data type as well. Okay. 
So new opportunities, right? This is, uh, this is great stuff. And I think new opportunities for existing users and that there's a strong demand for, uh, for being able to store on structured data. What I, what I like about this experience as well is that you can store structured, you can store unstructured, and you get to use all of MySQL's other features. So you have transactions, you have replication, you have that performance observability that I said is really valuable. It allows you to make performance problems shallow. Um, now that you have these new opportunities, should you use them? Is it good to use JSON or is it good to use columns? It's up to you. There are still advantages to columns. Uh, the advantages that I'll point out, what I like about having schema is that it's enforced. It allows you some control. You an application developer, you don't have to expect all these permutations of the data and then have all this if else than that. It's really restricted to one form that you can expect. And you can spend a lot of your code in complex systems handling edge cases. So this is an opportunity to be able to limit that. Schema has some sort of control, some sort of constraint over the data. On the JSON side, the advantage is that it's more flexible. Flexibility can be good too. And, and the, the most obvious example that, that I like to give on flexibility is uh, customization. So let's say that we're a, a SaaS application, we have many customers. One of our customers has asked for the application to be changed to handle their specific use case. In a relational way, this can be painful. They're asking for something that you have to find a way to model that is abstract and not specific to them. And one common way that this has traditionally been done for cost, custom fields is something like EAV, is the attribute value. We have this auxiliary table, and the auxiliary table has kind of name, value, key this. You're, you're familiar with this? I, yeah, and I think JSON is pretty much a complete replacement for this. I've thought about it many times. When would I still want to use EAV? Every example I've thought about, I want to use JSON. I think it's really good to be able to model that in, in a nice, elegant way. It's better for performance in every way that I've thought about as well. It allows the data to naturally denormalize together. Right. And for the database, it makes many short rows. Short rows are bad because we have some overhead per row for features like MVCC. It has lots of redundancy in the rows. It has bad execution plans. Oh, it is a hard problem. All right. Um, second set of advantages for JSON um, is that when we store stuff together in one column, it's naturally denormalized, which is an optimization. can be a, a bad optimization, too. But if you cluster things together and how you access it, the number of logical pages that you have to access to execute query, that's a lower number that's better. Um, there's no painful schema changes, although we have improved this in, in MySQL 5.6 where we have online DBL. There still has to be a lot of work that happens internally as you add columns and so forth. It's easier for prototyping. It's easier because you just start sending the data in a new format to the database server and it understands it immediately. Um, there is a case where you may want to use both. I showed you one hypothetical example of both with the SaaS application. Let me show you another hypothetical one. I'm trying to model components in my laptop. We have RAM, we have a hard drive, uh, we have a CPU. They have some commonality, they have a name, they have a manufacturer, they have a serial number. They have some non-commonality. RAM has gigabytes, CPUs have gigahertz. Those variable attributes that could be stored in JSON. The common ones, we imagine that you had a, a website like eBay and you're listing items. You need the description. Uh, you need the price. Uh, that's shown in many places, but if you drill down into looking at the individual component or item, some categories may have custom attributes. This is a great case as well for JSON. Trying to model that in a relational way is hard. Okay. Um, so I, I had a couple of other slides as, as time permitted. I, I think I um, I'll spend less time on them just uh, to answer questions instead. 
Uh, we added some other auxiliary features in, in MySQL 5.7 that tie well together with this experience. Uh, we have new constraints in our world with SSDs that they're smaller in uh, capacity, but they bring other performance characteristics completely. We can see that this is, uh, you know, this is completely much better than a hard drive with everything uh, other than uh, what their capacity is. And so this creates new opportunities for compression. Because if we can reduce the, the disk space, this ends up being very important. And compression works well when we have a lot of repetition. JSON documents have repetition because each of the keys, it's all self-contained in a document. So by having this new feature with this new feature, this works very well. Um, the new compression also is supported very well, and then we have larger pages in MySQL 5.7 where we can go up to 64 kilobytes. So uh, let me just show you when I compress um, the sample data that I had available. Uh, I can get basically a 50% space saving as well. Another feature to look forward to in MySQL 5.7. And a, a second set of, of features for MySQL 5.7 that could help you out a lot is we have improvements to, to triggers which allow you to migrate between your schema and your schema list. You can allow more than one trigger per event per table. We allow server-side query rewrite. So if you can't change your application, we can change your application. As the queries are received on the MySQL server level, we can match a pattern, and we can say, now execute the query this way. Kind of like a regular expression. But it's, cool. it's very efficient, actually, how it works internally. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's pretty wild, right? I put out a blog post today describing how to work around the change in behavior by doing some really fancy query write stuff. Okay, so my last slide, that uh, roadmap, where are we headed? Um, we're very committed to the JSON experience. Got a lot of good feedback about this. Uh, I'm very happy with what we did for V1. It's a very compelling feature set. Uh, where are we headed? What ideas do we have? Uh, we'd like to be able to do an in-place update in a future release, which is that uh, internal thing that's not exposed to you. And related to that, a partial streaming of JSON data to a slate. Um, we'd also like to be able to lift the limitations on virtual columns, but they don't support full text in GIS. And we'd like to allow you to have kind of like a race where uh, wouldn't it be nice if it's a truly unstructured environment that if you had a model that had customers and it said phone number, that could be one phone number or that could be three phone numbers. And it's just an array. And if it's three phone numbers, then we have three entries in the index pointing to an individual row. That's a multi-value index. So we think that that would uh, be useful as well. And uh, this is just a, a link for uh, a slide with some links to uh, grab deck from my deck later and, and see uh, where you can learn more about this stuff. But with that, I'll open for questions. <laughs> Okay, you get a mixed set through uh, compression. Yes. So you've got a whole load of data that isn't there in a normal holder setup because all the connects. Yeah. All the time there. Does that take you back to more or less what it would have been with a normal table? Um no, not not always. Uh, you're only compressing on a per page level, which could be up to sixty-four kilobytes. I think in my example I use sixteen kilobytes. And uh, sometimes to, to save more, you might need a larger size, 64, one meg, something like that. I still think it might be a little bit more diverse. What I'm saying is, yeah, how does the practical storage of those tables need to be in the row? Bulk out document size, how does that relate to just the normal relational way? Yeah. Because you've got that extra, got, got so much more extra stuff. Yeah. I mean, I. I I'd need to look at a sample data set to answer that question, say, for this data set, et cetera. But on an individual key name, if that's repeated many times throughout the document, it's repeated once in the binary format, because the dictionary is at the top with fixed offsets. So never say anything in that scenario. Um, but yeah, I would expect it possibly could be more verbose than the structured data. Yeah. It's not always a concern size. It's a concern. For SSDs, I'll agree to that, and this is the default now. 
But traditionally, I mean, you have some level of redundancy. Indexes are redundant. So I don't want to overhype the, the problem. But certainly, if we can reduce size, we can benefit. And I saw in the roadmap you mentioned improved GIS indexing. Yep. So what indexing is there for GIS in 5.7? We have an R tree index, which is very efficient to be able to do a two-dimensional lookup. Are you able to do sorting by distance and things? Yeah, or is that still quite inefficient? Yeah, I, I'm not the product manager for the GIS stuff, so this is one of the areas that I know the least of on the server. Yeah, but there's, there's a lot of stuff that was added. Um, we made the strategic choice in MySQL 5.7 as well to replace our built-in GIS stuff with a project called Boost Geometry. And, and we did this because we know we want to expand this direction. Every mobile app uh, needs location features. We've also started contributing back to the Boost. So it, it is much better than it was in, in, in 5.7, but I just want to cut off before I uh, make a mistake in misdescribing uh, <laughs> the feature. Yeah. Um, I found it difficult to explain without using the word JSON. Right. What is JSON? Right. Yeah. How it works. Yeah. So, you know, if I'm just saying, if I was to show him and he called JSON, it's like, Right. Yeah. So, um, I'll flip back to a big JSON slide for an example to answer your question. So, uh, this what we have put back is not what you input because we store it internally in an optimized way, and then we retrieve it back and present it to you how we choose to. The question is, can we make that look a little bit more pretty? Yeah. Uh, there's no JSON pretty function or anything like that. Um, I have heard this feature request. Uh, it would be interesting. I'll take note. So it would be, I think, it's added, let's say, for the party, it's just the GUI type, MySQL, and this. Yeah, so our GUI, MySQL Workbench, does have the JSON editor. The GIS uh, feature as well. The, the, the products are well integrated and, and they're close to lock step in release. So this is me using the command line client just so it could appeal to all audiences. But you do have other options to edit this in a, as well as your application in a way that's a little bit prettier. But on a, on a command line interface, there's no JSON pretty or anything. Just going back to the virtual table, you said that virtual columns. You said the six Supplies a degree of validation. Does that mean if you try and write a JSON document with the wrong data type, we can consider it there? Yeah, could. Yeah, so you would have to do some sort of parsing in your expression. I knew that you couldn't build an index on it, but then you realized I never realized afterwards that if you're pulling that validation, you should get that. Yeah, because I'm mapping here between the, the, the JSON world and the relational world, and I'm choosing a data type. It has to pass that data type or null. Yeah, I, I thought it might just go in and do the or something. But no. Yeah, so you could do that. You could do that in your function definition. Use one of my skills built in to, to check the type. Yeah. Give this, then that. Yeah. Or cost. It's the, the brute force way. <laughs> yeah, I used cost it to, to know the my skill syntax for cost in, in one of my examples when I was demonstrating the comparator. So you, you, can do, you can do additional cases. Yeah. yeah. You can do yeah. Have to handle the cases and then default to the past. Yeah. Um, which will solve the problem. But yeah. it's very complex every time you add another. Yeah. Uh, you know, path through the, the code. My one big question is the Mongo voice. You say you have a lion's twelve or whatever since you have Mongo's. You just have two data cases. Right. You know, the idea that, you know, it's a, uh, that, 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 <laughs> Accidentally, I, I think our features want, our customers want these features too. I think because you know the example we showed is exactly the problem that Magento's had, for example, the last 
yeah. 10 years. The whole problem of scaling in Gento is because of the EAB bottleneck in there, the bottom performance and the lack of, you know, when you've got unstructured data you're using EAB, which is a very old world uh, kind of pattern. And now that's just disintegrated, so you really need the Gento 2.3 or whatever so that uses the JSON format and gets rid of these secondary tables where we know it's in the same context. Well, you know. Well, the classic is it's you know certain yeah. clothing or whatever you've got color variations, you size variations. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. Perfect. This was my PC components thing as well. Yeah. It's the same exactly. thing. Yeah. I mean, but on the other side of that, 